My part today is going to be along the same theme, but uh, we're going to be dealing with bitter root judgments. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise Lord. I'm going to be doing some reading, but we're going to let the Lord have his way. Amen. I, after I thought about it, I said maybe this would have been good at the end of the series, but I'm here now, <laughs> and I don't have anything else, unless the Lord says so, right? Yeah. Hallelujah. But um, the apostle said God spoke to him to do a series on uh, children that are angry with their fathers, mm -hmm. and it's so right on. Really, he is specific, specifically targeting children who were hurt and abused in some form by their fathers as children and are now adults and still carry that anger toward them. The issue could be abandonment, rejection, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, and etc. and go on. Today we want to share how if our anger or resentment isn't dealt with properly, bitter judgments and expectancy in our hearts toward our fathers can form and curse our own lives. I want us to really be listening today because um, I do know this the Holy Spirit is going to visit us mm -hmm. because he wants us whole yes. he wants us hearts healed and he wants to bless us hallelujah for his purposes yes. hallelujah <laughs> glory to God dealing with bitter judgments it's something we all, excuse me, we all deal with. And there is no one that's <coughs> exempt to its effects. We may not understand the terminology, but we can recognize its effects as we go on with this lesson. Bitterness are sinful, sinful reactions <laughs> and are condemning judgments of people. And our refusal and an inability to forgive. They are our reactions, responses in our spirit to what is, has been done to us. We then develop an expectancy that others will do the same to us, a self-fulfilling prophecy. <coughs> The scripture references that you will hear today is Romans 2, 1 through 6. If you want to go back and look over these scriptures, Matthew 7, 1, Galatians 6, 7, Hebrews 12, 15. Okay? <clears throat> what are better root judgments? As a child, and can be an adult as well, when we experience or observe something we didn't like, we often make judgments about the person we connected to that event. I think we can all go there some place in our life. Amen? When there is bitter judgment, there is the inability There is the inability to, or refusal to forgive someone. So forgiveness is very key. And forgiveness is a principle, a law in the kingdom of God. Amen. It's not something that we should often do frequently. And we understand the word where it tells us how Jesus asked, how often should we forgive? And he said, the disciples asked, the disciples asked, well, how often should we forgive? He said, 70 times 7. And, and anyway, what it means is, 
as often as necessary, a situation presents itself, you should forgive. That's the law. And you know what, I, I, in studying this lesson, I realized that we don't think, uh, we hear the word of God, but we don't pull out the principles of the word of God as being law to us. Amen. And when Jesus said, obey my commandments, he's talking about these principles and laws that we should live out being kingdom kids. Amen. Galatians 6, 7 said, these are the operations of the unchangeable laws of God. They are fixed principles which cause us to reap in kind what we have sown. Okay? They bitter judgments, they are the operations of the unchangeable laws of God, which causes us to reap in kind what we have sown. Galatians 6 7 said, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Amen. Amen. So if you sow peace, you're going to reap peace. If you sow anger, you're going to reap anger. Huh? If you sow money, you're going to reap it. There's this other law of reciprocity. Amen. The law of reciprocity says, Give, and I should be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. But that doesn't always mean money. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I'm trying to stay with these notes. Um, <laughs> bitter judgments are not hurtful. Listen. Bitter root judgments are not hurtful or terrible things that happen to us. Okay? Nor are they the sins of those who wronged us. Bitter root ju judgments, they are a sinful, get this, our sinful responses to those things that have happened to us. Planted deeply within us due to our refusal or inability to forgive. Amen. Forgiveness is powerful. Amen. We don't know what it's keeping us from. Amen. Hallelujah. Just, okay, I wanna, I gotta move on to another page, I'm sorry. There can be judgments of parents Probably the first place we judge others is in our home or is with our parents. They are the first authority in our life. They are the first ones we see. They are the ones responsible for training us in the way we should go. Um, this may happen very early in our life and we may have completely forgotten about it. It is not as important what your parent did to you even though it may have been wrong, as a judgment that you made against them, going back to reciprocity. What you judge, the measure that you judge, it'll come back to you. Amen. Um, when we judge our parents, we also dishonor our parents and put the law of dishonoring your parents into motion. I'm going to give you the scripture for Deuteronomy 5.16. The law. Honor your mother and father as the Lord your God has commanded you this day, that your days may be long and it may be well with you. Amen. Amen. That's Deuteronomy 5.16 Honor your mother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Honor your father. Yeah. Even if they're not perfect. Yeah. Even if their settings and situation is 
not advent, not advantageous to you, but could have uh, caused some kind of hardship to your environment. We're still to honor them. Amen. 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 Because of the Father of all fathers, He can make things right in our life. He can make things right in their life, but if we judge them, we can defile them without judgment. Amen. And the Amen. thing we don't want to get, we end up getting. Amen. Amen. And, and, and the uh, important thing about judgments is they, they stay with you. It's a law of judgment. It stays with you. And it goes to grow up with you through your life. Um, let me get there. I'm going to get it myself. Okay. Love covers, and because our love and loyalty to our parents may cover up the hurts and subtle judgments that we may have made against them, even if our remembrance of our parents seem rosy and fine, the surface manifestation of bad fruit always reveals a bitter root. If there's some kind of attitude and a chip on your shoulder, and uh, sometimes they might ask you to do something, and it might be a negative response to come out of it. Know that there's a root of bitterness somewhere, or anger. Amen. Um, we may need to ask the Holy Spirit to show us any areas where we may have judged our parents with. With us being in the Lord, I'm sorry, that's something else, I'm sorry. Uh, judge our parents. Satan used the laws to release curses in our lives. He accuses us and pronounces us guilty of every violation of the law so that he can bring the consequence of the law into our life. You get that? Yeah. He accuses us and pronounces us guilty of every violation before God. Because he know the law. Uh, he know it better than we know it. So that he can bring the consequences. He's legalistic. And he will look for every dot or tittle of missing the mark or sinning or um, not obeying the, the, the law as we know it and use it against us. Amen. That's why he worked on our conscience. Okay. Every unconfessed violation of the law opens a door of darkness in our lives. And Satan, by demanding that the law be fulfilled, steals from us through the curses. What the Bible say about Satan's character? He came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what he's using. Those bitter root judgments, those curses. They give him assets to work, work against us. Repeated violations of the law of judgment begin to build strongholds. Habitual patterns of thinking in our lives that control our thoughts, words, emotions, and actions. Let's look at Deuteronomy 28, 15. But it shall come to pass, if you don't obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statute which I command you today, that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deuteronomy 28, I'm going to go there briefly. It's a good word because it makes us really search our hearts. 28, 15, verse 15. Okay. It says, Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the country. Curse shall your, be your basket and your uh, netting bowl. Mm -hmm. 
in, in other words, cursed shall be your, your covers. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the uh, produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offsprings of your fields. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. Okay. The Lord will send on, on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke and all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed, until you curse quickly. So Satan knows these things. He knows the law. And so when we uh, are cursing ourselves or uh, not forgiving, it can cause these things to happen to us. We can wonder why we're suffering lack. We can wonder why, you know, we can't get ahead. Because our, what we do our, in, uh, outside of the law, it can cause these curses to come upon us. Okay, so we're going to move on. Everybody clear so far? Yeah. God does not bring problems and destructions into our lives. Good news. It is the consequences of breaking the law of judgment. Only through the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ can we escape the fulfillment of the law of judgment in our lives. And we'll look at Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. This is Jesus teaching. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Amen. Through what he did on the cross, he fulfilled the law. He, he, uh, took the punishments of our sins and he, his, with his life he broke the curses because this, the word said curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. So he took that. So we can go to the Lord when we have issues in our heart, when we have bitter uh, anger against someone. If there's unforgiveness that we are, it's hard for us to re release, if we were confess that and take it to the Lord Jesus Christ, he will forgive us. Amen. And he break the curse off us. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Hallelujah. We become what we have judged in others. The law that is set in motion when we judge others is found in Romans 2 1. I'll go there and read that. Romans 2, 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O oh man. I want you to see God's heart and how he feel about judging others. Therefore, you are inexcusable, man, whosoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. So, when we're judging somebody else, watch out. Because, see, God don't see it the way we see it. He said, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. Now, how are you going to judge somebody when you're doing the very same thing? You're bringing a curse on yourself. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think, oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you would escape the judgment of God? I don't think so. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? That's a wonderful thing. Amen. Amen. God can treat us so well and and what he don't give us what we deserve. And that's well, the more reason why we should appreciate him in our lives. Amen. Romans, um, oh, our judgment of others allow it to take root in us. And eventually, it will bring forth the same behavior, either in ourselves, our spouse, or our children. Wow. The, our judgment of others allow it to take root in us, 
and eventually it will bring forth the same behavior either in ourselves, our spouse, or our children. And I want to talk a little bit about roots. Uh, and I'm getting this from uh, John and Paula Sanford's book, Transformation of the Inner Man. Roots support the plant and provide all the water and nutrients it needs to grow. In a similar way, we have roots that allow us to draw nurture from God, others, self, and nature. These roots begin to grow from our first encounters with life and are well-developed by the time we are three and five years old. Isn't that something? Three and five years old is when we can start making judgments in our hearts according to our environment. From these roots springs forth the trunk, branches, and leaves that make up who we are and how we respond to life. These roots are affected by our environment while growing up. If the environment was filled with lots of nurturing love, gentle touches, and tender looks, we would be able to draw good things into our life and produce good fruits as we grow up. On the other hand, if we are exposed to an unsafe environment filled with strife, anger, hate, abuse, rejection, neglect, or abandonment, then our bitter roots will draw bad things from Satan and others. And we will produce bitter fruits in our lives. Bitter roots are all Bitter roots are our sinful actions to hurts. None of us been hurt, right? I can think of a lot of ways I've been hurt. Oh, okay. If you got the fruit, then you got the root. If you cannot get good fruit from a you cannot get good fruit from a bad tree or root, if you have bad fruit in your life, then there is bitter root somewhere that is producing it. Um, you cannot kill a fruit tree just by picking the fruit off it. Under the right conditions, the same type of fruit will begin to appear again. Okay. Delivering ministry is good, but, if, but it often does not get to the root issues that produce the bad fruit in a person's life. Let's look at, I, I um, and some of us that like to work in the yard, sometimes you be trying to get a weed out of your pretty grass. And sometimes you pull that thing up and you break off the, the top and the root is still in the ground. Huh, you know, sometimes I, I attribute that to like, you know, pacifying our hurts, but not really dealing with the real issue. And so, because we don't really deal with the real issue, the root is still there, even though we cut the top off that made the grass look bad. And so when we dig, and we find out that, you know, that root can go almost four feet in the ground, three feet, you know, so, it's hard just to get it off if you just t get and don't get the tap root. It's, it grows right back up. In a few months, that stick, that old ugly weed is sticking up in your pretty yard. How, isn't that like our life? Sometimes the things we go through and things that we are, are angry about and even though we don't deal with it every day subconsciously, something will trigger and we are responding in a way that we shouldn't because that root hasn't been dealt with. Amen. And until we allow God to get to the root or that tap root, which probably went back to our childhood, sometime it could have been in the womb when, uh, for instance, if our parents didn't want us, and in the womb, we felt that rejection. So it starts a process in us. We start judging right there. Our, our 
good look is affected by that environment. can grow up feeling unwanted. Feel like nobody care about you. They say they do, but in your heart, because of what you experience, your, your perception is that nobody really wants you or nobody will care to be around you, okay? Mm. We're dealing with the roots. Only through the grace of God and the cross of Jesus Christ we can uh, uh, escape the fulfillment of the law of judgments. Thank God. We become what we have judged in others. The law that is set in motion when we judge as a founders. I read that. I was there at dinner. Okay. Uh, I was dealing with roots. I'm sorry. We must dig down and kill the root for the bad fruit too. Uh, root cause for the bad fruit too. Even then, it may take several times to remove all the strength from the bad root to finally put it to death. Okay? Um, out of uh, bitter roots come judgmental and critical spirits. You know, I used to be real critical. And I, I wonder why. I know now. Judgmental and critical spirits are some of the most destructive, bitter root influences in our lives and can hinder our ability to receive and give love away. Can I read that again? Judgmental and critical spirits are some of the most destructive, bitter root influences in our lives and can hinder our ability to receive and give love away. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes our plumbing get clogged up and we want to love, but it's just, clog we clogged up, we can't express what we really want to. It's because of these bitter roots. When we judge others, we set in motion a spiritual law that demands a response. The way we judge others is the way we will be judged. And we read that Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Judge not that you be not judged. The standard and measure of our judgment will come back on us at some point in our lives. Unfortunately, the judgment we receive is usually much greater than what we sow. Hmm. Because of the laws of sowing and reaping and increase. Galatians 6 and 7. Galatians 6 and 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows who is flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So there again, that principle, that law of reciprocity. Uh, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. It is not God judging us, but the law, okay? When we judge another for the wrong done to us, we are demanding payment for the wrongs. We cannot expect mercy for ourselves and judgment for others who wrong us. You know, we want mercy, but we want to judge and condemn somebody else. Our bitterness or resentment toward those who hurt us causes a judgment that demands justice. The judgment against us is the curse of reaping what we sow. 
the judgment against us is a curse of reaping what we sow. So we don't want to really be uh, judging others because we don't want to reap what we judged. Amen. And when it come back, it come back to us in a greater measure. Amen. Bitter root judgments have the full power of law behind them. Matthew 7, 1 and 2, the principle of uh, and you should not judge that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. And come back on us through our defilement of others around us. This reinforces our ungodly belief and causes us to develop bitter expectations from the judgments. Bitter expectations are more psychological, but they can seem like the truth because of the fulfillment of the law of judgment. Bitter root judgment remain hidden or forgotten. Listen to this, because we have to search ourselves and ask God to reveal in a bitter roots in our hearts. Most bitter root judgments remain hidden or forgotten until the Holy Spirit brings them back to our remembrance. The first indicator that we have these judgments is the fruits associated with the judgments in our lives. Okay? Um, For uh, the results of judging, in nature there's a law of physics that say for every action there is, amen, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. That same law works in the spiritual realm as well. Hallelujah. We activate the law of sowing and reaping. The seed we sow of anger or resentment may seem tiny, but they will keep growing and coming back on us again and again and again. So it's like a, a, somebody making a snowball to start off with a little ball and they keep rolling in the snow, rolling it in the snow, rolling until it becomes huge. Same thing with those judgments. Amen? They start small. It's subtle. But if you don't deal with them right away, it'll start growing and increasing. And one thing I, I have learned to do in my life is when I get offended with somebody, I choose right at that moment to forgive them. I said, Lord, I, re I forgive them. And when I say I forgive them, it lose, leave my mind. It ain't, ain't muddling over it. But I learned that. Be quick. The words that be quick to forgive, slow to wrath. When you don't forgive quickly, it turns to wrath. Then it turns in, wrath is anger. And then anger, bitterness. And then you can't even stand to look at the person. And you imagine all kind of things about them that is not true. It's out of your pain. Lord, help us. We activate the law of sowing and reaping. Um, the law of judgment says that what you measure out will be measured back to you. The judgment seeds we sow must someday be reaped if left unrepented for. The longer it goes without repentance, the larger and larger the seeds become. Generational patterns may be a result of sons judging their parents and reaping that same problem in their lives and marriages. And you heard me share the story. I worked with a young a girl when I worked at the bank. And she had an alcoholic mother. And she hated the way she lived. And she made her inner vow that she'll never marry nobody that drank. Or she wouldn't get married. But she had judged her mother as being a sloppy drunk. 
And unfortunately, when she married, she married somebody that drank. And it's, it's very sad, very sad. But I don't think she had kids because of that. But those things are real. You know, I had a boss, his name is Mr. Fitzpatrick. He was city treasurer. God bless his heart, he's, he's passed. But he judged me on being late every day. Now he told me not to, if I'm late, don't worry about it. He said, he told me that. And then all of a sudden, when I was a few minutes late, he judged me for being late every Sunday, every, every day. And because he judged me, guess what? I was late every day. You get what you judge. I just, I mean, I, would, I don't care how hard I try. Seemed like when my husband get in the car, he would just, he liked to sightsee and he just drive so slow. And I'm trying to beat the clock, trying to get there on time. I said, if I get there at least at 8 o'clock, I'd be on time. It would be five minutes after 8. And I don't care what I did, I could not be on time. Well, Mr. Fitzpatrick retired, got a new boss, and uh, he didn't have that judgment on me. So guess what? I got to work a half an hour early every day. Every morning, I was on time, overtime. So there's something to these bitter root judgments and expectancies. What you judge and you expect, that's what you're going to get. And you know some of the things we say, I'll never I'm going to never do this to my children. Lo and behold, them things come out and be bad, and guess what you're doing? <laughs> Verse 8, thank you, says, <laughs> Bitter root judgments. I wouldn't let no man hit me. And every man come in your life, they whipping up on you. Because you judge your daddy when you hit your mama one time. It's real. Are we relating? Can we? Is it registering? Because the judgment come back on us, we begin to expect those bad things to continue to happen. We develop bitter expectancies that are now self-fulfilling. They started with us, and our expectancies now, they're coming back to us. They're like a prophecy. Judgment produced bitter expectancies that will force other people around us to fulfill them. The situation, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Bitter judgments in marriage. Bitter root judgments are expectancies, and expectancies are in every couple, and in fact, they are what typically draw a couple together. Can you believe that? I can, because I remember I, I said, I'm not going to, I didn't want to argue and be contentious. Well, I married somebody that, Wanted to argue and be contentious, so I argued and was contentious back at him. I got what I said, right? All right. Bitter root judgments and specs are in every couple. Since we are a complex bundle of what have happened to us in the past, we may not even be aware of what we bring into marriage. In our hearts, and um, bring into a marriage in our hearts, and how that controls our perceptions, attitudes, and behavior. 
The hidden things from the past become trigger points that cause us to explode at our mates. Man, so the impetus is not them so much as what was in us from the beginning. Those judgments we made. You know, when we get upset with somebody and explode, then we got to, well, sometimes we ask ourselves, well, why did that happen? Why did I do that? You know, it wasn't all that. It wasn't that big a deal. But it made me explode. It had to come from somewhere. And a lot of times we just accept it, you know, and we move on and get all right, ask our mate to forgive us sometimes, and then we we move on, but it's still there. So the next time that situation happened, the response is greater. It gets greater because it's deep and it goes beyond a person or beyond our mate. Each may has certain expect expectancies of the other, other depending on how they judge their parents while growing up. We expect our mate to behave in certain ways based upon what we saw our parents do. We expect them to treat us the way our parents treated each other. Oh, that's another one. <laughs> Boy, I could, I would, um, you, you just do things. You, you see your parents do, well, your dad always provided. And, um, you know, bills were already paid. Didn't have to be in the dark, you know. But when you get married, and sometimes that your mate might not have that responsibility. And so you judge them, you know, on the basis of what your father did. And then you find out, well, why are you upset? because you should pay the bills and pay them on time. We shouldn't be in the dark. You know what I mean? So those things trigger strife and arguments and bitterness, but it's, it was so us than what we grew up with. So we bring that over into our marriage. Uh, we have expectancies that maybe the other person didn't have. And then there are things about us they don't like, you know, that we do. And uh, they get explosive at us because you, you might challenge them with something that their mother would challenge them with and unbeknown to you, they explode because there's a root there in them. But why does God put these kind of people together? You wonder. Well, I found out in my reading <laughs> that God used each other's backgrounds to grind, to humble, to bring down, <laughs> smooth out them rough places, you know, so that we have to look to God and get his involvement in our relationship. Now, in some relationships, in the circumstances, people are drawn to God. Or they're drawn closer to God if they have God in life, or they're church, but they don't have a personal relationship. But by the time that spouse finishes with them, they're going to have a personal relationship. <laughs> Ask me how I know. I love my late husband. God healed us and we forgave each other. Hallelujah. I thank God for that. So it made me better. I didn't have to reap those things or those bitter roots because God healed me. He healed me. I got a lot of healing. So don't, don't, uh, negate getting healing for issues that we have. We need help. And we need help from God. And it'll make you better. And it'll cause the blessings of God to be in your life. I 
I want to talk about inner vows. God take our vows seriously. Um, Latricia, last year, a couple of years ago, last year, no, one last year, I think it was the year before, she did a teaching on vows. Remember that? And uh, it was good, but I, could, I didn't relate. But I relate now. God takes vows very seriously in Numbers 30, 20. I give this a point of reference. Deuteronomy 23, 21, and Ecclesiastes 5, 4. Do I need to um, give that again? Numbers 30, 20. Deuteronomy 23, 21. Ecclesiastes 5, 4. Another bit of root... This is another form of a bitter root that can arise from judging others is inner vows. An inner vow is a hateful order against our body, usually spoken as a child, that is sent through the heart and mind to the body. The words spoken are a creative force, a creative force that will affect what we say it's a creative force that will affect us until it is broken through the cross. We do not grow out of them as we mature or have a change of heart. You can have a change of heart about yourself, but that inner vow goes on unaffected until it's broken by the cross of Jesus Christ. Our mind may forget about the vow but it will eventually manifest itself in our life and physical body. Even good vows that were compelled by the flesh and not the spirit need to be released so that the flesh does not rule in that area. My God, that's deep right there. Inner vows that are good things we can can cause a flesh to rule in errors of our life and maybe God don't want that thing in us. And so it gives that flesh strength and it will rule you even though it's good. It's a good thing. I'm going to read that again. Even good vows that were compelled by the flesh and not the spirit need to be released so that the flesh does not rule in that area. Vows may lie dormant for many years. The manifestation of inner vows may lie dormant for many years until the time set by the vow or the right situation or person triggers a vow to be activated. There was a little girl who was continually bothered by her cruel brother, embarrassing and physically hurting her. One day out of frustration, she vowed that she would never have a baby boy when she grew up. After marriage, she had two girls, but she aborted three baby boys. Holy Spirit brought back the incident of the vow during counseling. And after breaking the vow, she was able to have a baby boy. Wow. They usually are forgotten until the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. Inner vows lodge in the heart and cannot be removed by our own fleshly efforts. They strongly resist change and work in tandem with other bitter roots. Woe, hidden resentment and fear. Only by using the authority of the name of Jesus, usually by another believer, can a person be released from our inner vows. Now, if we have made inner vows in our lives, and we say, well, I can pray and I can get through to God, uh, I got news for you. It ain't going to work. You will have to have somebody to pray for you. And you know where the words say, Confess your faults one to another that you might be healed. 
it works with inner vows. Amen. Praise God. Inner vows can block God's plan for our lives. For example, most boys learn early that their mothers are very observant and remember almost everything that they say and do, good or bad, especially related to emotions and feelings. Mother used this knowledge later as a means of control. Okay, this is a, a situation. You used to get excited about, I remember when you liked to, a boy under this pressure may vow, I will never show my emotions or feelings around a woman. It is not safe. Later, when he is married, he may find it hard to express his feelings or emotions to his wife, even though he may want to share them. They may have had good communications while dating, but the trigger of marriage brings out the inner vow and he now finds it hard as a husband. You know, when I was reading that and I thought about, you know how uh, you, before you get married and, and, and uh, your fiance, y'all get along so well and y'all talk and y'all understand each other, but what is it about marriage? It's something about marriage that bring out the worst in us. <laughs> Let me, don't let, don't get me wrong. Marriage is a wonderful thing. I love it. It's a wonderful institution. It's, uh, it was given by God. But when you're not saved and you don't know the Lord, and a lot of times we do know the Lord, that coming together brings some stuff out of us. And this author was saying, it don't trigger until you get married. And so we should never say after we get rid of the first husband, we should never say, I'll never marry again. Because it might not be God's plan for your life. But don't judge him now. Forgive him. And recognize that you weren't perfect either. And you are just as responsible for what you did in the marriage as he, he was. Amen? So watch those inner vows. Um, let me see, I was reading about. When he married, he may find it hard to express feeling emotion to his wife, even though they may want to share them. Um, even though he, he wants to work things out, sometimes inside that he is not aware of stops him. Something inside of him He's not aware that it's stopping him. He may repent, try over and over again, only to revert back to the old pattern programmed by the inner vow against his mother. The inner vow will continue to confine him to isolation until it's broken in his life. Inner vows uh, form complex structures of bitter roots that must also be broken to be completely set free and as, as in the example above, he may have withdrawn from relationships and hardened his heart. He may have developed evasive and defensive habits to protect himself from being hurt. There may be bitter root expectancies and fears. He may be incapable to trust or have other controlling actions like anger. Breaking free from all these may take some time through counseling, love, and forgiveness. Sometimes the things that we pass through and it hurts the bitter roots, um, it will take, it'll take counseling. And uh, so we shouldn't despise counseling. And uh, a lot of people don't like disclosure, but the truth will make you free. Amen. When you come into the light as he is in the light, you know, you shouldn't fear the exposure because you're in a safe place and your place where you can be loved and accepted. Okay, fears may be rooted in inner vows. Another, after some embarrassing or scary event, we may have vowed never to take any risk beyond our control, never to speak in public, never to grow up, never develop breasts, never try again, or never will want to wear hand-me-downs. Inner vows, fears. 
You may have vowed, I will never be unprepared when people ask me a question. You may then be tense in a group discussion, or if there are too many situations that require many quick adjustments, you may experience a mental breakdown or a panic attack. Some of the most destructive vows concern personal relationships, especially marital relationships, are rooted in a child's determination against his parents. You know, there are some children that just, just will go against the grain, I don't care what you tell them, they're gonna go against the grain. If you said I'll get even with my mother or sister, you may become angry at women, especially your wife or daughters. I'll never let my brother or sister get the best of me again may result in you becoming very competitive in business or with peers and family. You may vow, I will never get angry like that, only to find yourself withholding anger until some situation causes you to explode like a volcano. Principles operating in our lives. Other example of inner vows, I'll never do that again after feeling shame. I'll never be like my mother or father. I'll never act like that. I shouldn't be here. I'm in the way, so I choose to hide. I'll get even with her, a mother or sister, which can be projected on all women, not trusting women. I'll never let my temper go again, so you store up repressed anger. I'll never raise my voice, which is good, yet it's your flesh doing it, not God. We need help to break inner vows. Once the Holy Spirit reveals an inner vow, find another strong believer and have them use the authority of the name of Jesus and break the inner vow. The person breaking the vow must be a personal, uh, have a personal faith in the power of the Lord to act on their behalf. You must speak to the inner child and release the child from the habit of or connection to this inner vow in Jesus' name. Then release the child to enjoy the original freedom they had in that area before the vow was made. Then ask God to reveal to the adult the freedom from the effects of this inner vow. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is death wishes. Death wishes are words that we speak against ourselves concerning death such as, I wish that I had never been born. I wish the Lord would just take me home right now. I'm so embarrassed, I could just die. If there were difficult times around at the time you were in, in the womb, your birth, or just after birth, you may have made death wishes without even being aware of doing it because you felt that the world was not a safe place. So these are... Uh, prenatal uh, inter, uh, uh, death wishes because of what you're feeling in the environment around you. Defilement lies behind death wishes. The spirit that comes to earth to inhabit a new human being at conception has only the remembrance of the beauty and wholeness of heaven. If the parents love and long for the child to come, the child begins to recover from the shock of entering this world of sin and chaos. That's what God intended in relationships. He intended for every child to come in a, a safe place. But when we sin and we go outside of the law, when we have our babies outside of marriage. It can cause these kind of issues and problems with children. If the parents, the child begins to recover from the shock of entering this world of sin and chaos. However, if the atmosphere outside the wound is one of turmoil, fear, fighting, hurtful emotions, and violence, or if the delivery is difficult, then the spirit inside the child feels like this is not a safe place to live and begins wishing they were dead so they would not have to live the life in such a place. Death wishes may come if there were tragedies, death, or traumatic happenings during the pregnancy 
or shortly after birth, or if other children and family were jealous of the new baby or did not welcome it into the family. Your parents may be disappointed that you were the wrong sex. All these kind of scenarios are fruits of death wishes. These death wishes show up in the new baby and young children as behavior problems. Self-hatred, chronic sicknesses, dangerous physical conditions or diseases, or they are accident prone. The immune system does not work right because the body does not want to live. Death wishes can affect coordination and confidence or take the zest, take the zest for life out of us. Our parents' words can impact us. The words from your parents can also cause a person to form death wishes. If you were told that you are no good, you will never amount to anything, you are hopelessly stupid, or I wish you were never born, you can begin hating yourself and wish that you were never born. One person we know had her father tell her that the darkest day of his life was the day she was born. Isn't that something to tell a child? If you just felt like you were in the way or were an inconvenience to your parents, you may wish that you could die so the pain would go away. You may have not been conceived at a good time in your parents' life and they may have considered having an abortion. If you were abused as a child, abandoned, given up for adoption or rejected by your parents, you may feel like you do not have a right to live. You may wish that the Lord would just come and you could be done with the miserable life here on earth and go to a better place. Wow. Uh, death wishes can affect our physical body. We can walk with a deliberate bent over look that does not allow our body to move smoothly. It may affect your voice and rob the diaphragm of power to sing with gusto and joy. The person may not view life as, mu as more than just existing as long as they have to be here. Death wishes may affect our sexual fulfillment. They engage in sex more out of duty or for whatever, whatever little enjoyment they may get from it. They never come alive to the experience the glorious union with their mate in the spirit and ravish the love and joy of true sexual fulfillment. Usually people with hidden death wishes do not even want to engage in sexual activities. Hidden, hidden death wishes may also hinder one from fully expressing the talents and callings given to them by God. Their spirit is not free to venture and explore life. You see how important this ministry is to the body of Christ in this area. Because there's a lot of people having issues from these very things, bitter root judgments. If you do not love yourself, you dishonor God if we created you. We are commanded to love ourselves, Mark 12, 31. We need to forgive God even though he really never did anything wrong and be reconciled to him in our own heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 20. God forgave us through Jesus Christ and we forgive God by faith, reconciling each to the other. We must be open and honest with ourselves. We must break free from the fear and shame of our past, confess our sins one to another. Confession in some ways is like becoming a child again, open, vulnerable, and trusting. Luke 18, uh, 17. As the shame melts away in this new transparency, you can begin to love yourself. You cannot use salvation as an escape from being what you were. Jesus and God accepted you even before you were born again, just the way you are, but they love you enough that they do not want you to stay that way. We must repent for rebelling against being born where he put us and the family he gave us. We must repent for rejecting ourselves we accept our bodies and ask God to reconcile us to ourselves and to our time, place, and position in the earth. Amen. Discipline yourself to daily choose life and blessing, not death and cursing, Deuteronomy 30, 19.
These are the scripture warnings against bitter root judgment and expectancy. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness, bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land of the in the land the Lord your God has given you, Deuteronomy 5, 16. This is a repetition of the scriptures that I gave to you in the beginning. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself, because you have passed judgment, do the same things. Romans 2, 1. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measures you meet, it will be measured to you again. Amen. How do we get free? We have to choose to repent by determining to stop patterns by hauling judgment expectation to the cross in prayer. The prayers must be specific focus, spirit-led prayers of forgiveness. A person must speak forgiveness at the age of the judgment, praying out loud his or her forgiveness for mom or dad for judging, resentment, hating. Forgive me for perpetuating those attitudes in my present relationships. Have others to pray for you. Prayers of death, uh, the prayer of death pray that the bitter root judgment expected in your life will die. Okay. One thing I have learned uh, uh, in, in uh, this study is in going over the scriptures, reading other books, and I knew it in my head, but I don't think I really knew it in my heart. I know Jesus Christ is the theme of the whole Bible, Old and New Testament. But second to that is relationships. God care about relationships. He care about how we respond to each other, how we feel about each other. And the second greatest commandment, he said, love God with all thy heart, thy soul, and mind, and have no other God before him. And he said the second one was to love thy neighbor as yourself. Amen. So relationship through the whole stream of the Bible from old to new, you're dealing with relationships, you're dealing with difficult relationships, you're dealing with tragedies, you're dealing with all kind of situations. But God wants us to bottom line is to love each other because if we love each other, we won't be bitter against each other. Amen. And if we have been, then we have the opportunity through Jesus Christ to make it right. Whether they're here or gone, it doesn't matter. We can make things right in our heart so that we won't get the same thing that we judge in this life. Amen. I'm done. <laughs>